I guess you need a bit of time to get things set up right. <clears throat> you don't? <clears throat> well, I do. <clears throat> I uh, didn't bring all these uh, things up here today to, to frighten you, but uh, many of you have seen this before, I think. And uh, some of the sporting material that I have brought today uh, is... Uh, uh, I will not be reading. I just simply want to uh, use it to illustrate some points. <clears throat> Are we ready? Okay. I guess I'm ready. If you're ready, are you all ready? Are we all ready? Okay. We're all ready. <clears throat> Speaking of being ready reminds me of something that used to happen in Little Rock, Arkansas many years ago when I was pastoring the uh, Little Rock, Arkansas congregation <clears throat> had one member who had uh, had a health problem and uh, he, uh, he was really a fine man, very converted and very dedicated to God, but uh, it seemed that every time he would sit, regardless of where it was, whether it was church or wherever, uh, as soon as he sat down, it was like someone pushing a button and it turned him into uh, uh, what, somnambulance or whatever they call it. Anyway, he was asleep uh, almost instantly. And uh, the other day I was reading uh, a uh, comment in Reader's Digest about uh, a story about a rabbi who had a problem with one of his parishioners, I guess. <coughs> um, he noticed the man kept going to sleep all the time when he would uh, start speaking. So finally he spoke to him about it and he said, you know, <clears throat> I really uh, don't understand. Is it, is it my speaking? Is it something I'm doing or not doing? Uh, just why is it that you go to sleep? As soon as I start speaking, you're, you're asleep. And so the uh, parishioner said, well, Rabbi, it's like this. He said, uh, I have such confidence in you that I have total trust, and as soon as I sit down, I know that anything you're, you say or do is going to be okay. So therefore, I rest easy and I go to sleep. So it's a matter of confidence. Now what I'm going to say today is that for all of you, uh, rest easy now. What I'm going to talk about today is something <clears throat> that you can uh, feel confident in, but uh, I do hope you don't go to sleep. My subject is uh, today the devices of Satan. If you were Satan, how would you deceive the people of God? That is, those people who hold the truths that have been revealed by God through Jesus Christ and his servants uh, historically. Paul Harvey, a uh, commentator here in the United States, also uh, has a column. <clears throat> Paul Harvey wrote many uh, years ago an a column or article entitled, If I Were the Devil. I'd like to read that because it has some significance and meaning in this subject today. Paul Harvey said, if I were the prince of darkness, I would want to engulf the whole world in darkness. I'd have a third of its real estate and four-fifths of its population, but I would not be happy until I had seized the ripest apple on the tree. So I would set about to take over the United States. I would begin with a campaign of whispers. With the wisdom of a serpent, I would whisper to you as I whispered to Eve, do as you please. To the young, I would whisper that, quote, the Bible is a myth. I would convince them that man created God instead of the other way around. I'd confide that what's bad is good and what's good is square. And the old I would teach to pray after me, <clears throat> our Father who art in Washington. I'd educate authors in how to make lurid literature exciting so that anything else would appear dull, uninteresting. I'd threaten television with dirtier movies. I'd peddle narcotics to whom I could. I'd sell alcohol to ladies and gentlemen of distinction, and I'd tranquilize the rest with pills. If I were the devil, I'd soon have families, churches, and nations at war with themselves until each in turn was consumed. If I were the devil, I would encourage schools to refine intellects but neglect to discipline emotions. Just let those run wild. Until well before you knew it, you'd have to have drug-sniffing dogs and metal detectors at every schoolhouse door. 
Within a decade, I'd have prisons overflowing and judges promoting pornography. So soon I could evict God from the courthouse and the schoolhouse and then from the houses of Congress. In his own churches, I would substitute psychology for religion and deify science. I'd lure priests and pastors into misusing children and church money. If I were the devil, I'd make the symbol of Easter an egg and the symbol of Christmas a bottle. If I were the devil, I'd take from those who have and give to those who wanted until I'd killed the incentive of the ambitious. What'll you bet I couldn't get whole states to promote gambling as the way to get rich? I would caution against extremes in hard work and patriotism and moral conduct. I'd convince the young that marriage is old-fashioned, that what you see on TV is the way to be, and thus I could undress you in public and lure you into bed with diseases for which there is no cure. In other words, if I were the devil, I'd just keep right on doing what he's doing. <clears throat> if you were Satan, how would you deal with though, a people who have been instructed in the laws of God, the truths of God, people who understand and have known the way of God. In the latest World Ahead magazine, lead article, Mr. Meredith's article, Are You Dancing with the Devil, is illustrative of the situation that exists in the world and what he emphasizes and what he uh, uses to illustrate uh, somewhat at least this article <clears throat> is the uh, extreme cults. And of course, he also refers to the uh, wiles and the, the devices of Satan as well. But in the world, generally, the, when you speak of Satan, when you speak of the devil, when you talk about uh, the devices of the devil, people tend to believe, as he points out in the article, that uh, the devices of the devil, of Satan, are these weird, far out, way uh, extreme uh, types of behavior. And yet, those are the fringe elements of Satan's deception. And they certainly do not have any impact on the people of God. But the scriptures speak of the devices of Satan and also of the wiles of the devil. Would you, if you were Satan, try to deceive God's people, those whose minds have been opened up to the truth of God, by a head-on confrontation or by an oblique assault? Would you strive to deceive God's people by attacking the message, or would you uh, discredit the message, all the while flattering the messenger? In order to answer these questions, how would Satan attack God's church and the truths taught by it, I think we need to first understand <coughs> Satan's nature. In an article uh, in the International Bible Standard Encyclopedia, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, I'll get it right, uh, the, the uh, word Satan, <clears throat> they tell us, comes from, in the Hebrew, Satan, adversary, is the definition of Satan, uh, from the verb Satan, to lie in wait, as an adversary who would lie in wait. Uh, to uh, destroy another. <coughs> In the Greek, <coughs> uh, it is also uh, Satan. Uh, satanas means adversary. It is also, there's a Greek word, in it's uh, diablos, which means, uh, or is translated devil, also means adversary or accuser. And there's another Greek word, although this is unclassical and un-Greek in, <clears throat> in one sense. It is used in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, translated accuser, and that is 
kategor. Now, he defines the uh, character or the nature of Satan <clears throat> by first giving uh, the names, character, uh, defining the names and the character. And he says the most important of the scriptural facts concerning Satan are those, uh, the most important uh, of these are the Hebrew and the Greek equivalents noticed above. In all cases but one, when the article is omitted, it is used in a general sense. The one exception where uh, Satan in the Hebrew is used, First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1, where the word is generally conceded to be used as a proper name. This meaning is fixed in Greek times <coughs> in the New Testament. So we're thus enabled to note in the term Satan and devil the growth of a word from a general term to an appellation, that is, to a name, and later uh, to a proper name. All the other names of Satan, save only these two, are descriptive titles. And then he gives a number of scriptures that pertain to it, which some of which we will go through uh, momentarily. He talks about the works of Satan. He makes a real good point <clears throat> in paragraph 3. Uh, he said, the worldwide and age-long works of Satan are to be traced to one predominant motive. He hates both God and man and does all that is in him uh, to defeat God's plan of grace and to establish and maintain a kingdom of evil in the seduction and ruin of mankind. He definitely aligns the Bible against the popular idea that a man may abide a definite and conscious personal, uh, may make a definite and conscious personal alliance with Satan for any purpose whatsoever. The agent of Satan is always a victim. In other words, what he is pointing out, and I skipped over a, uh, an important section there that explains, I think, uh, the full thought, <coughs> is that, that Satan uh, when he uses an individual to do his bidding, that individual becomes a victim of Satan the devil. And uh, it is important, I think, for us to understand that, to realize it, and to appreciate that point and that truth. Some people like to point to Judas Iscariot, who was most definitely an instrument of Satan the devil. And they say, well, you know, could uh, Judas Iscariot ever be saved? Is it possible that Judas Iscariot could come up in a resurrection and have a uh, chance uh, for salvation? And I th would have to say that it's not for us to judge. <clears throat> uh, Jesus Christ himself said, have I not called you twelve and one of you a devil? Uh, as if uh, Jesus himself knew the character of the individual the proclivity, the tendency of the man. And he literally brought him into the uh, intimate circle of, of Christ for a specific purpose. And if that be so, then perhaps it is important for us not to judge him. Let Christ do that. He continues to say, on the contrary, it is perfectly evident that Satan's power consists principally in his ability to deceive. A lot of people fear Satan, I think, and <clears throat> he is certainly to be, uh, his power should be respected. Uh, however, I don't think we ought to fear Satan, and I don't think we need to fear his kingdom or uh, those who are his uh, agents specifically in the spirit realm. It is interesting and uh, characteristic that according to the Bible, Satan is fundamentally a liar, fundamentally a liar, and his kingdom is a kingdom founded upon lies and deceit. The doctrine of Satan therefore corresponds in every important particular to the general biblical emphasis upon 
truth. That is, on the one hand, you, there is the lie, and on the other hand, there is the truth. And it's just that plain and that simple. Nor, he said, it would, now it would seem that to make Satan preeminently the deceiver would make man an innocent victim and thus relax the moral issue. However, according to the Bible, <clears throat> again, this is uh, according to this dictionary definition, uh, according to the Bible, <clears throat> man is a participant in criminality or in crime in the process of his own deception. He is deceived only because he ceases to love the truth and comes first to love and then to believe a lie. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. This really goes to the very bottom of the problem of temptation. Men are not tempted by evil per se, but by a good which can be obtained only at the cost of doing wrong. The whole power of sin, at least in its beginnings, consists in the sway of the fundamental falsehood that any good is really attainable by wrongdoing. Since temptation consists in this attack <coughs> upon the moral sense, man is constitutionally guarded against deceit and is morally culpable in allowing himself to be deceived. The temptation of our Lord himself throws the clearest possible light upon the methods ascribed to Satan. The temptation was addressed to Christ's consciousness of divine son sonship. It was a deceitful attack emphasizing the good and minimizing or covering up the evil, indeed twisting evil into good. It was a deliberate, malignant attempt to obscure the truth and induce to evil through the acceptance of falsehood. The attack broke against the loyalty to truth, which made self-deceit and consequently deceit from without impossible. The lie was punctured by the truth and the temptation lost its power. And that is very, a very good observation concerning the temptation of Christ. The reason Jesus Christ was able to resist Satan is because he resisted him and he countered with the truth. And by keeping the truth uppermost in his mind and knowing the truth, Jesus Christ resisted and fought off the assault. <coughs> Christ's, I mean, sorry, uh, Satan's nature is defined <coughs> by the names that are attached to him. He is called, John chapter 8, verse 44, a liar and the father of lies. He is called in 2 John chap, uh, verse 7, a deceiver who has deceived the whole world. He's been very successful. Uh, by the way, this, uh, this Greek word deceiver is planao, and uh, <coughs> it... Uh, it is from uh, uh, another Greek word that uh, means uh, is plain uh, to properly cause to roam. That is to, uh, to leave safety, truth, virtue, to go astray, to deceive, to err, seduce, wonder, be out of the way. And so in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, uh, the, uh, we read in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, that the great dragon, that is Satan, was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Two names used together. He's called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. And he was cast forth, and his angels were cast out with him. And uh, <clears throat> this uh, prophecy... It would seem that this is uh, in our day, perhaps certainly uh, in our lifetime. Who knows? Maybe it's already happened. We don't know. <clears throat> Another one of his attributes or part of his nature is as, as a destroyer, or attacker, or murderer. Uh, especially, he seeks out the sick, the weak, uh, those who 
who he can victimize. <clears throat> he is a, I, I have a sense that Satan, or Lucifer, the devil, uh, however you wish to refer to him, is frustrated. I, I feel that he knows he is a defeated enemy, but he is determined to persist in his destructive warfare through repeatedly, though repeatedly he has been defeated in the past, for example, uh, before even the creation of Adam and Eve, the creation of mankind, Jesus Christ describes seeing Satan cast down out of heaven, Luke 10, 18, as lightning. He said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And in the case of Job, Job chapter 1, verse 6 through 9, <clears throat> uh, Satan came before God along with other angels of God. And the scripture says in verse 7, <clears throat> And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? And so Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and walking back and forth on it. And then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? And so Satan answered the Lord and said, Well, <clears throat> yes, but does Job fear God for nothing? Does, doesn't Job receive a benefit? You take away the benefit, the implication is, if you take away the benefit, he will curse you. You know the rest of the story. I don't, we don't have to read the whole story because it's very common knowledge that God allowed Satan to tempt and to test Job, and Job did not cave in. Job did not give in. Satan was wrong. Job worshiped God. Job served God. Job obeyed God for another reason. Now, he may still have had a weakness. He may still have been less than perfect, but that does not alter the point that Satan was lying about Job. He was accusing Job falsely because Job was a righteous man. Which brings us to the next point, and that is <clears throat> that uh, Satan, the accuser, uh, is uh, the accuser of those who obey God and those who resist Satan and who resist his liberal government. And I, by the way, this is a quote from Mr. Armstrong uh, in a uh, publication, an article he wrote in 1985. Satan is the accuser of those who obey God and resist him and his liberal government. Now, recently, <clears throat> there's been a flurry of activity in one part of the country because of uh, a rather liberal pastor who has been preaching uh, some very liberal views, extremely liberal, in which he says <clears throat> that members are sad and confused because the worldwide Church of God, quoting him, no longer believes it is God's one and only true church, or that it had all the right doctrines, end quote. He said these members are also sad and confused because the Worldwide Church of God is de-emphasizing the law and the Sabbath and the holy days. And finally, he said, we are having God to mercifully reveal to us, through himself, of course, the meaning of grace. God's church didn't understand grace. All those... 50 some odd years of in the past. <clears throat> he said only a Jew would take the approach that the Sabbath and the holy days were for Christians. Only a Jew, huh? He said the membership should forget everything the church 
the nominal group, Worldwide Church of God, ever taught them in the past concerning law and grace. He said there will be much peer and family pressure from within the church to prevent the membership from giving up the law and accepting grace. He said some fear that giving up the law and relying on grace will lead to immorality. But he said Christ is guaranteed that a person under grace will not live an immoral life and that assurance should be enough for everyone. And there's more. I, those are just a few of the points in his particular uh, sermon <clears throat> or sermons. As a result, there's been a considerable stir uh, in that area. And uh, the need for uh, a, uh, an apology, as it were, uh, by apology, I mean it in the biblical, I'm sorry, in the theological sense, not an apology for what was said, but a uh, justification, because that's what the term, uh, in effect, um, means <clears throat> in this context. And so a principal has written to uh, members of that area who have complained about uh, the uh, points being taught by this uh, individual. <clears throat> uh, and this party writes and says, Mr. So-and-so has not preached against the observance of the Sabbath and the holy days or against keeping the commandments or tithing. He is teaching that we need to focus our worship on the lawgiver rather than the law. The law is important and defines how God asks us to live, but it is also important to realize that it is not part of the new covenant in the same way that it was part of the old covenant. Ignoring what scripture says about, I will write my law in their hearts, uh, etc. We keep the commandments and, and observe the holy days because we are striving to do what we know to be pleasing to God, and that's why we do it and not because uh, it's required for salvation uh, that we have to uh, obey God uh, because of uh, his, uh, his commandments. If you were the, <clears throat> the Satan or the devil, how would you deceive God's people? How would you, how would you deceive God's people into believing that the truths the fundamental truths which had been taught and ingrained in them for, who knows, 20, 30, 40 years? How, how would you deceive God's people into uh, rejecting those things? Back in the 70s, <clears throat> there was this publication, the Systematic Theology Project. The STP, it is called, was called the acronym. The Systematic Theology Project attempted to define doctrine for the Church of God and to distill it into this manual, which the ministry then could take and could ex use to explain doctrine to the membership of the church. The first section is on primary doctrines, God, the Bible, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, mankind, angelic realm. Section two is on salvation. Three, on kingdom of God. Four, law of God. Five, the Christian. Six, the church of God. Seven, traditional Christian doctrines. And this is how it is broken down. Mr. Armstrong was not a participant in the development of this manual. I was asked to submit articles or write-ups on some of those topics, and uh, as were <clears throat> all of those who were uh, in of my uh, rank and peers in the field, and uh, then those articles were uh, taken by an editor who is a principal in the. Uh, administration 
of our former uh, parent organization today. <clears throat> and the net effect, based upon Mr. Armstrong's assessment and statement to me personally by telephone, the net effect was that 95% of what was published in this text was accurate and good. 95% of it, he told me, he felt was accurate. But he said, Carl, if you have a beautiful plate of food and 5% of it is arsenic or strychnine, is that good? See, Mr. Armstrong perceived very plainly and very clearly that a little bit of error a little bit of error can be deadly. And that is why Mr. Armstrong, when he came back into health, because this was published just, as I recall, just before or just after, I think it was just before his heart attack. And after Mr. Armstrong came back, he came back and he determined that he was going to set the church back on track. This manual, more than anything else, represents what Mr. Armstrong was setting back on track, what he was correcting. Those of you who were in the Church of God in 1978, remember it was doctrine, doctrine, doctrine that Mr. Armstrong wrote on for the worldwide news in putting God's church back on track. Recently, <clears throat> someone wrote uh, to uh, headquarters and uh, they asked uh, headquarters our parent organization, <clears throat> what, uh, what it really meant when Mr. Armstrong put the church back on track in 1978. And this is an official answer from a correspondent to that question, a correspondent in Pasadena. He said, In 1978, and I quote, Mr. Herbert Armstrong, Herbert W. Armstrong removed his son, Garner Ted Armstrong, from his offices in the ministry and administration of the church and college. This was the end result of many years of trials for Mr. Armstrong. He had hoped that his son would prove himself faithful and worthy to succeed him. Actually, Garner Ted Armstrong was temporarily removed from office privately several times over the years. In 1972, Time Magazine learned of it and had a couple of articles. At the end of 1977, at a minister's conference, certain decisions were made and material passed out to the ministry that had not been authorized by Mr. Herbert Armstrong. The real problem was insubordination. <clears throat> it was not the doctrine. It was insubordination. That was the real problem. Government or uh, lack of... Uh, adherence to government, they are uh, saying. The real problem was insubordination. This is what Mr. Armstrong had to correct. Several other leaders were fired in early 1979, and others were demoted to lower positions during that year and the following couple of years. Finally, in the early 1980s, Mr. Armstrong had resolved the problem of pe uh, people trying to appoint themselves as leaders at least within the church. So it was uh, government, it was insubordination that uh, Mr. Armstrong had to deal with. <clears throat> Let me quote another publication. This is Truths That Transform. It is a transcript of a radio program that uh, discusses the changes in 
our parent church, our parent organization. The announcer says, is the kingdom of the cults about to lose a member? We'll survey the latest dramatic changes inside the worldwide church of God next on Truths That Transform. And the interviewer is asked, <clears throat> when is a pseudo-Christian occult no longer a cult? Uh, I'd take exception to the use of the terminology uh, a pseudo-Christian occult no longer a cult, but uh, that's neither here nor there. <clears throat> so the interviewer begins to ask this uh, uh, participant for... Uh, explanations and, uh, and uh, his analysis of the church. And he gives a bit of background and a bit of history. The interviewer says, historically the church has strongly claimed that there was a large statistically inspired counterfeit church and that the worldwide church of God was the only true church. Have there been any changes of late on that claim, asked the interviewer. And the respondent said, that's a subject that is still not clear. Let me read, if I might, a statement by the former public affairs officer, assistant public affairs officer, Mr. Mike Snyder, in a letter he sent to Watchman Fellowship dated March 9, 1992, concerning this concept of the one true church. Mr. Snyder stated that the church's position is that it is not the exclusive body of knowledge. The church does not teach that can only <clears throat> the church does not teach that can only can work only with those of the membership of the worldwide church of God. I take it a word has been dropped out of the transcript. I think what it means to say is that the church does not teach that God can only work with those of the membership of the Worldwide Church of God. <clears throat> Yet, they quote, in a sermon given by the Pastor General, Mr. Dekach stated, quote, Now I hear the rumor going around that I don't believe this is the only true church of God. You are my witnesses. I believe with all of my heart that this is the only one and true church of God. End quote. So we have a conflict of what the church is telling us and what it's telling its own members, according to this transcript and according to the interviewer. I'm sorry, the, uh, the respondent to the interviewer. Continuing, <clears throat> question is, well, what about these alleged changes that are going on within the church? And the respondent says, we have done extensive research, extensive interviews, talked to a lot of members and former members, and we are convinced that there are true and genuine changes that have taken place in the church, in the doctrines. In our opinion, the le leadership is caught between a rock and a hard place. Many of their top ministers are attend attending Bible schools outside of the church and are being exposed to orthodox theology. They are bringing these doctrines, these new church and actually changing church doctrines. He says they are bringing these new doctrines uh, and understanding back into the church and actually changing church doctrines. The doctrine of who God is, the doctrine of born again, these have all been changed to conform more with orthodox Christian thinking. So there are real changes taking place and we applaud that. And we have pers personally conveyed to the leadership at headquarters that we applaud them for their research and understanding. But <clears throat> at the same time, to make such a drastic change, they are concerned that they are going to lose a lot of members because these are 180 degrees opposite what they have always taught. What they are actually telling the members that they are not making any, but they are actually telling the members that they are not making any changes whatsoever, but they are just explaining the old doctrines in different ways. 
it goes on. I won't read the entire uh, article because <coughs> it is strictly a continuation. Another publication that has uh, that I have received uh, essentially acknowledges the same thing. Uh, Worldwide Church of God acknowledging the plain truth about the Trinity. Uh, this is from Christian Research Journal, and uh, they analyzed the, uh, the changes uh, in the same way. <clears throat> of course, for quite some time, there were assertions, no, we're not making any doctrinal changes. No, we're not changing anything. We're just redefining and re-explaining what we have always believed, and on and on it goes. <clears throat> Now then, let's get back to a subject of Satan. If you were Satan, how would you deceive God's people who know the truth? Would you deceive them by a head-on assault? Or would you do so by an oblique attack on the flanks? Anyone who has studied military tactics knows if you have a strong opponent, you must attack from the rear, you must attack from into a weak area, you must attack on the flank, you must feint and attack here and strike in another place, and on and on it goes. And so the, the real author of military tactics is uh, no fool in the sense of, uh, I guess, in the sense that we would mean it. When it comes to tactics, he understands them. He invented them. And the tactics that he would use are the same tactics he has used in the past, historically, and as cited earlier. Now, in the creation story, <clears throat> we read that uh, the earth was in chaos and confusion, and God recreated the earth. And in Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, we read, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, as God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden, so he engaged her in uh, an, an interchange of ideas. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. <clears throat> in other words, um, God actually went beyond. He, he set up a hedge, if you please, a defense for man. He said, just don't touch it because if you do, you will die. The implication being, if you touch it, another action will follow. And this is true. One action leads to a, another action, which leads to another action, and ultimately uh, sin follows. Sin is the result. Well, the serpent said, you will not surely die, verse 4. God knows better than that, I think one translation says. Verse 5, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. As if knowing evil is good. Knowing good is good. But is knowing evil good? No. God knows that it isn't. He would have, he, he instructed man not to eat of that tree because it would produce evil fruits, as it did. And so we find <clears throat> that Adam and Eve followed the instruction of the serpent, they followed his lead. And the end result was destruction. In the history of the serpent, or Satan, the accuser of the brethren, as I mentioned earlier in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus Christ said, He beheld him 
as lightning cast down from heaven. He must have been there if he saw it. Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Messiah, saw Satan cast down from heaven in that rebellion when he sought to overpower God and to destroy God and to, to unseat God from his throne. And Christ said he saw it. Job experienced it. He didn't see it. He experienced Satan. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, describes Satan and the fall in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 15. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lower depths of the pit. The prophet Isaiah said, and he will be. The prophet Ezekiel describes Lucifer and his power and his beauty and how he was created, how, how great he was, how beautiful he was. There is, there is no way for us to comprehend with the limitations of the flesh a being that has within himself the ability to make perfect music, have perfect wisdom, and knowledge. We cannot comprehend it all in one package, if you please. That's what God created when he created the one who became Satan with awesome power and beauty and ability. But he is uh, spoken of as uh, having wiles. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 7, we're told, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, what are the wiles of the devil? The Greek word <clears throat> from which wiles is translated is methodia. Number 3180 in Strong's numerical system, if you want it. It's from a compound of meta and hodia, hoduyo. It means traveling over, that is, travesty or trickery, while lying in wait. It is method, methodia, from which we get the word methods. Oh, yes, Satan has methods. An example of his methods are, uh, well, one of the best examples that I can think of is uh, found back in Numbers chapter 22 through verse uh, chapter 24. When the nation of Israel was in its infancy, <clears throat> before entering into the promised land, before going across into Palestine and being established as a nation in their territory, in the account of Balak, who wanted to destroy the, the people of Israel, he engaged a prophet who seems to have had some connection to God, Balaam. I don't think that we can appreciate or understand quite what that connection was, unless perhaps it is that he was possessed of the one who <clears throat> himself, uh, or at least he was inspired and at times possessed uh, by Satan himself or uh, one of his demons, but that is remains to be seen. 
in that particular instance, the wiles, as the, the term is, from the Hebrew, nekal, or nekal, it means deceit. It's the, it's the equivalent of the Greek word, which is translated wiles in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. In that particular case, the children of Israel were compromised and thousands of them were put to death, died horrible death simply because of the method of Satan the devil of seducing God's people through an action or actions of interaction with the people, the Midianite people. Another one of Satan's uh, devices is, is bitterness. <clears throat> Paul speaks of it in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. He says, we have to look carefully lest any of us fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And observation by this, many become defiled. Many are defiled by bitterness. Now, there are examples of bitterness in the New Testament and the Old as well. Acts chapter 8 is probably one of the, the most classic in the New Testament. There was a man named Simon, called Magus, who became uh, filled with the, the idea that uh, he, ought to, uh, he ought to be involved and become a part of this operation that was going on, and he, he wanted the power that uh, the apostles and the uh, servants of Christ, the ministers of God, had. And so he tried to buy that, uh, purchase that power, and he offered money to Peter. And Peter, as a result of uh, his the perception of the Holy Spirit, spoke to him and said, I perceive that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. The Apostle Paul says, we must let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away with all malice. Now then, <clears throat> we are not to be ignorant of the devices of Satan the devil. We must understand his methods. We need to be aware of how he works. In ancient times, specifically in the days of uh, the apostles, there was a religion that came into being called Mithraism. That particular religion began about the time of the life of Jesus Christ, according to History Now, in an article in the current issue of Biblical Archaeology Review. This, I'm sorry, it's not current, it's September-October issue. The article, lead article, Mithras Worship, Bull Slaying, Mystery Solved, has an, an interesting, very interesting analysis of Mithraic, Mithraic uh, religion, the cult of Mithraism. And I don't believe the author intended to do so, but I, I think that he clearly illustrates that the baggage, the, um, uh, the, the trappings of Mithraism are or were uh, the uh, essentially those of many Christian religious groups today. You read the article yourself if you wish. Actually, the author David Ulancey has a book on this subject <coughs> if it's of interest to you. But uh, it illustrates how Satan cleverly, subtly, subverted from the truth, he subverted people who professed to be Christian and introduced 
an old religion with a new coat because Mithraism came out of, the fundamentals came out of Persia, although the um, specific religion was a new religion of the first century. Now, offenses are very, very much a part of uh, Satan's methods. An example <coughs> is what happened to the church of God at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians, the apostle Paul had to write to the church and deal with a problem that occurred in the church of God at Corinth. And that was one of porneia, or as it's translated in the King James, fornication. He said, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 through 13, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And you're puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, meaning by the authority of Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Then he indicts <clears throat> this particular church for their inattention to something so important and so major as this particular uh, issue. What was the result? Well, the result was that this church was the leadership, at least the local leadership of that church was asleep, and the membership of that church was asleep. It took someone from outside, the Apostle Paul, from a distance, had to take the reports, evaluate the reports, and then respond and tell them what they had to do. And they did it. They had to deal with a blatant sin, a problem of such magnitude and uh, greatness, uh, devastation to the reputation of the whole church, the church of God, even in the eyes of the pagan world. Now, after the membership dealt with this man <clears throat> and uh, the sin that he uh, was involved in, another problem cropped up, and that problem was that they would not, could not bring themselves to forgive him. And furthermore, they were at odds, they came to be at odds with the Apostle Peter because, uh, Paul because Paul did forgive him after he repented, and as a result of his forgiving the man, they not forgiving the man, the Apostle Paul had to write in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. Paul said, I determined this within myself, with myself, that I would not come again to you in heaviness. For if I make you sorry, who is he that makes me glad but the same which is made sorry by me? And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I come I should have sorrow from them of whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you, previous letter, with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. But if any have caused grief, he has not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. So that, contrariwise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore... I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not 
ignorant of his methods. Now, the Apostle Paul had, upon knowledge or information that the man had repented, he had forgiven him. The people had not forgiven the man, however, the ones, the local people, and uh, they kept holding against him, and ultimately it created a rift between themselves and the Apostle Paul, and he had to deal with it, and it was a painful matter to him. Satan is very clever. <clears throat> what I guess what this illustrates more than anything else is that Satan takes advantage of us coming and going. He takes advantage of us when there is a situation that must be corrected. He takes advantage of us and tries, if that situation is corrected, he tries to get in there and then he tries to take advantage again after we have resolved a matter and he tries to destroy us by inspiring or conspiring against us and putting in a thought, an idea. I can't forgive. I can't forget. I can't accept that individual. I'm pointing this out because <clears throat> we in God's church specifically global are ripe for such a backlash and a reverse condition. We are vulnerable to such a condition today because I think we having made the break, having made the step to obey God and not to cave in and not to allow ourselves to be deceived taken into apostasy, we may find ourselves holding a root or having a root of bitterness and holding that bitterness against people. And we must understand that the author of the problems that exist, the author is Satan the devil. He is the one who is our enemy, not any man or group of men not any specific person or individual. It is Satan the devil. We must remember that. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 4 says that he is the God of this world and he has blinded them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. If their eyes are blinded, if they are deceived, he is the guilty culprit, and we must look on beyond the human instruments. Continuing, casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We must bring ourselves into that spirit and that attitude and, and, and uh, uh, the spirit of forgiveness that Jesus Christ has toward people. When they repent, we must forgive. <clears throat> now, we've been exhorted by the Apostle Paul to stand fast and not be blown about by every wind of doctrine in Philippians chapter 4, verse 1 through 9. That's praiseworthy. It is praiseworthy to be steadfast and not blown about. And he said in verse 8, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Now the devices of Satan, <clears throat> if I may sum them up, are very plain. They are vain reasonings, philosophy, human reasoning. Number two, they are sensitivities, feelings, 
pride of the eyes, this, this business of going on feeling, this feel good. And if I don't feel good, then I am being persecuted and I have a right to feel good, so therefore I will do whatever is necessary to feel good. It's one of the tools of Satan the devil, one of his methods. <coughs> he plays on it millions, no, billions of dollars are spent on over-the-counter medications so that people can feel good regardless of why they feel bad. Isn't that right? We all use those things. We violate, we, we violate the laws of health, and then when we're hurt, hurting, when we have pain, then we buy something to make us feel good. Satan knows how to utilize that, <clears throat> specifically and particularly in matters of interpersonal relationships. He will play on sensitivities between a husband and a wife, a wife and her husband. He will play on sensitivities in a family, and he will strive to divide and to destroy that relationship. Thirdly, one of the tools, chief tools of Satan is lethargy. Lethargy, just plain being lazy, letting down, being too tired, too, too uncomfortable to resist. And number four, he, he utilizes fear. We know the scripture. Scriptures say perfect love casts out fear. The spirit of God is not a spirit of timidity, but of power and of a sound mind. But Satan plays on fear. And he has a lot of people right now fearful of obeying him, or obeying God rather, fearful of stepping out and standing firm, standing up for the truth, out of fear. I know one individual in particular who is so concerned about the tribulation that is, that is coming, <clears throat> the great tribulation. He is so fearful and so concerned, even though he knows that that church which he is in is going the wrong way, is teaching heresy, is, is taking his, the, the people down the wrong path. He is fearful to make any, take any action, make any move whatsoever because he thinks his salvation and protection from the great tribulation lies in that organization. lusts of the flesh Satan's next major tool <clears throat> might be uh, another individual it might be uh, money it might be a house it might be uh, whatever it may be but these are real things that Satan uses one of his methods is to play on our lusts another one persecutions Many times people simply, people who have stood up and resisted and have endured persecution in the past cannot stand up again to persecution from within the social club, the organization. Now, in dealing <coughs> with Satan's methods, God has some methods that we can use. We can take the example of Job's experience and uh, we can use uh, Job's uh, experience to our advantage. We can learn from it. We can, we can stand fast and we can realize from Job's experience that Satan will try to use those who are closest to us. In his case, it was family and his own wife, 
Satan will use those who are closest to us to try to destroy us and to destroy our position our, of faith and trust and obedience to God. And knowing that, God has given us that. It's already written for us, so we can look to it as an example. And uh, we can make our determination to stand. The Apostle Paul shows how to deal with uh, frustration in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk, that is, live, and to please God, so you would abound more and more. We walk, we live to please God, not ourselves. In order to please God, we abstain from those devices and those lusts that are held out by Satan. Psalm chapter 40, <clears throat> verse 1 through 4 is a beautiful chapter, a beautiful scripture on, uh, of support and encouragement when, when we are being tried. Psalm chapter 40, verse 1 through 4. Blessed is that man that makes the Lord his trust and respects not the proud, nor such as turn aside to, uh, guess what? To lies. Blessed is the man that makes the Lord his trust and respects not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Blessed is the man who fears God and delights in his commandments. Psalm 112, verse 1 through 10. Praise you the eternal. Blessed is the man that fears the eternal, that delights greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. It's a blessing to us if we fear God and delight in his commandments. Now, unfortunately, there are those who are buying into this idea that his commandments are really, you know, they're, we just automatically have them and imbibe and, and just, we just sort of, they, they exude from us if we have grace. We don't have to worry anything about what we do if we have grace. One of Satan's tools is to make us have a sense, a false sense of security. But Satan's tools can be blunted by and through the Spirit of God in prayer, fasting, communion with God. Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Jesus Christ, which strengthens me. And we can do whatever is required. If it's the work of God, we can do it. We can do it only by the Spirit of God within us and by His direction of our efforts. There is no way that we can do the work that is before us if we indeed are to do the end-time work of God. There's no way that we can do it without God's special intervention and direction and support. There's just no way it's humanly possible for us to do it, and there never will be. We have to learn to walk day by day <clears throat> as uh, sons of God with Christ living on us, knowing that we are children of God, we are sons of God, he is watching everything we're doing, and he is helping us in those places and times when we must have his aid. When we get up in the morning, we start off by getting God's way of thinking right into our minds, right off. I think we all have our ablutions that we do in the morning. We wash our face and wash our bodies, clean up our bodies. We also need to clean up our minds as we prepare for the day. <clears throat> and we need to reflect on each day after, uh, at the conclusion of the day, we, we should reflect on what we have done or failed to do with an eye on improving for tomorrow. 
and doing what God has given us to do. I think we have to think compassion and forgiveness and think of our work as a service to Christ and to God, <clears throat> not just as something that we are doing in order to uh, get a paycheck. I mean, if, if that's all we're working for, it is gone as soon as the month is over. Satan's devices can be blunted by the Spirit of God through communion with God, his intentions and his plots and his contrivances, his methods, must be overcome by God through his spirit within us. And he will give us the help that we need in order to do it. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, <clears throat> and I'll conclude with Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. When that day comes, when he is cast down the, the final time, we can virtually sing, even though we know there are hard times ahead for the earth and the inhabitants of the earth, as it says, we know there's a period of, of hard times and a tough day ahead, but we can rejoice because now is salvation and strength. We're weak today, but then we're going to have the kingdom of God and Christ himself reigning with us, directing, leading us, and helping us to serve those even those who accused us and maybe abused us. And, of course, we'll be free of that major accuser, the spirit, the power that is behind all accusations, the one who is the real culprit. We'll be free of him because he'll be bound and he won't have any power over or strength over the elements or the governments or any part of society when this day comes. We can rejoice. And yes, <clears throat> we will be able at that point in time with Jesus Christ to usher in a glorious and a wonderful world to come, the world ahead.